Al and Keith, you've given us our money's worth tonight. I'm almost ready to say amen going home. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them tonight to 2 Timothy chapter 1. As I said earlier, we're in a sermon series on Sunday night. We're looking at the value of parents, the value of mom, the value of dad, the value of grandparents, what they mean to a home, what they mean to the lives of those in your home. Not just down here, but one up there one day. Tonight's message is about a mom in the home. A mom in the home. Not a woman in the home, but a mom in the home. 2 Timothy chapter 1. The words of the greatest Christian man who ever lived, Paul the Apostle, writing a young pastor by the name of Timothy pastoring First Baptist Church of Ephesus. And notice what he says to Timothy about his heritage, about his lineage, about where he came from to get to where he's at. 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Now this is Paul talking to Timothy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. I wonder why he just didn't say faith. He's emphasizing that this faith is a real faith. It's a true faith. It's a biblical faith. It's a genuine faith. Paul says, When I call to remembrance the general, the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, that's where it began, and then was passed on to your mother Eunice, and now has been passed on to you. Verse 5, I am persuaded that what your grandmother had, which was a genuine faith, What your mother had, which was a genuine faith, Timmy, Timothy, it's in you. Let me ask you a question. Does a mother play a role in shaping the earthly life and eternal life of her children? Does a mother play a role, an important role, a high priority role, the utmost role? And shaping her children's earthly lives and subsequently their eternal lives. I consulted some experts to kind of figure out the answer to that question. One of them was a comedian. And he said his mother taught him many virtues he couldn't have learned anywhere else. He said she taught him about religion. You better pray that stain comes out of the carpet. She taught him logic. Because I said so, that's why. She taught him endurance and stamina. You're going to sit there till the spinach is all eaten. She taught him social graces. I'm going to teach you how to dance. To the tune of a hickory stick. (laughs) And lastly she said. He said she taught me cleanliness. I'm going to scrub your dirty hide with Ajax. (laughs) Now you're an older crowd. You know what Ajax is. If I said that over there. They'd look at each other like. A dying calf in a hailstorm. But that's what the comedian said. His mother taught him virtues that stuck with him now and maybe will stick with him throughout his life. But on a more serious note, I thought of what a beauty queen, a beauty queen winner, had to say about what her mother taught her. She said, among other things, she she taught me to always send thank you notes to someone who's been kind to me. That's good, pretty good, isn't it? Tell people thank you who have been kind to you. 
to brush your hair and your teeth every day, to dress well, appearance does matter. Never believe you can change anyone, including a man, not even with love. Stand straight, her mother taught her, and be soft-spoken. Learn how to sit with modesty. Correct people with the spoken word, but compliment people with the written word. Respect yourself and love others. Forgive all and show no malice to none. So whether you're a comedian and we laugh about it, whether you're a serious person and we think about it, I believe a mother is very important in the home. She might be the most important person in the home. Because in many ways, she will determine the destiny of her children in this life. And I deeply believe in the life to come. Did some research on Mother's Day, which is coming up May the 14th. And Father's Day, which is coming up in June. Because you might say, well, I, Pastor, I really believe Dad has more influence than Mom. Well, I... I beg to differ with you. The research shows different. Do you know that more telephone calls are made on Mother's Day than on Father's Day to mom or dad? The most calls that are made in almost any day of the year are made on Mother's Day and their children calling mom. Far more than children calling dad. Do you know more cards are purchased and sent on Mother's Day to moms than are sent to dads on Father's Day? More compliments are given to mom by sports stars and celebrities than are ever given to dad. How many, when you ever hear a sports star talk about his parents, what does he normally say? Hi, mom. <laughs> he don't say, hi, dad. And of course, dads are important, but I think the research bears it out with the cards and the calls and the, the compliments that children have a natural affection for mom. Moms have a natural affection for them. And because of that relationship, the opportunity to influence and impact is greater with the mother than with the father. Three things I want to lay on your heart tonight as we talk about moms in the home. Number one, mothers have a powerful drive to promote and protect their children. There's something inside a mother that drives her in regard to her children to want to promote them to higher things, to want to protect them from any danger. Behind a successful child, you will usually find a driven mother. Let me say that again. Behind a successful child, however you will define success, there's usually a mother in the background who's driving, who's pushing that child, not just to survive, but to thrive. Not just to survive, but to succeed. I was thinking about Rebecca in the Bible. She wanted to promote and to protect Jacob. That was her boy. She loved Esau, but Jacob was her son in a more, much more deeper, special way. And so Rebecca stepped in and helped Jacob connive the birthright blessing from Esau to himself. Rebecca was behind that. She may have been a schemer, and you may not like what she did, but she did it out of love for her son Jacob. She drove Jacob. She was the, the energy, she was the force that made Jacob who he was, at least in the beginning. And then think about Moses' mother. When she heard that Pharaoh was coming for her baby, she took the initiative to put her son in a basket and sail him down the Nile River 
with the belief that her God was big enough to take care of her son. And God was sure big enough, wasn't he? Because that baby floated right over to Pharaoh's daughter. And she took that baby. God gave her compassion on that baby. And she made that baby her own. But she needed somebody to take care of the baby. <laughs> so guess who she got? She got that Jewish mother who said, I'll do it. <laughs> and that was Moses' mother. But you see, it was her... It was her initiative, it was her ambition that saved her son's life. It was Rebecca's energy, ambition, drive that gave Jacob the birthright and made him one of the great patriarchs of the Bible. Remember James and John's mother? James and John were the sons of thunders. They had a temper. You don't have a temper, but they did. They got angry quick particularly when they were told no or didn't get their way. And they went back to their mother and said, listen, Jesus is a king and he's going to establish a kingdom, but he hasn't announced to us our cabinet position yet. I'd like to be secretary of state, mom. Mom, I'd like to be secretary of defense. And she said, he hasn't made you an offer yet? No, ma'am, he hasn't made a set of thing. So I can see her. Shh, Jesus, come here. Let me tell you about James. Hey, I got a picture of him. <laughs> and the patience of our Lord is amazing. And then, John, and then she said, let me tell you about John. Oh, that's my two boys. I love them both. Good boys, Jesus. Would you make a spot available for, uh, for them in your cabinet? You see, we, we, want, we say, well, she was ambitious. She was involved in things she shouldn't have been involved in. Yes, but she did it because she loved her boys. Moms do that, don't you, moms? So Rebecca got involved in the life of Jacob. Moses' mother got involved in his life to save his life. James and John's mother got involved. She wanted something for them that she didn't understand they couldn't have. And Timothy's mother, she saw a boy that needed Jesus. And she poured herself into him. She led him to the Lord, I think. She taught him how to live for the Lord. And then she introduced him and set up some private teaching lessons. By the greatest Christian man who ever lived. Paul the Apostle. She, she negotiated that out. That Timothy could sit under the feet of Paul and learn. Oh, what a mother who said, I want my son saved. I want my son taught. I want my son to be something for Jesus. Paul, would you spend time with him? Paul, I know you're a busy man, but he's got potential. Would you pour yourself into him? And Paul did. Four mothers. Four mothers who wanted their children to be more than just survivors. They wanted them to be, again, thrivers. More than just survivors, they wanted them to succeed, to make a difference in this world and in the world to come, to make a difference for themselves in this world and their world to come. Abraham Lincoln all of us would agree, was probably one of the greatest presidents this country has ever had. I think all of us would put him in the, one of the top three positions. Do you know that Abraham Lincoln's mother was a godly woman? And she invested much of her life, though she died young, into Abraham. And it is said that on her deathbed, this is what she said, and I paraphrase it, but this is pretty close to those who were there. This is what they said she said on her deathbed to her son, Abraham. She said, I'm going away from you, Abraham, and I shall not return. Be a good boy and live as I've taught you to live. Love your heavenly father. Keep his commandments. 
That's what she said to her son. That was the last words that came out of her mouth to her son Abraham. And you know something? He did what his mother asked him to do. Abraham Lincoln, I don't know if he had a godly wife. I don't know if he had a godly cabinet. I don't know if he had godly generals around him. But I know this, he was a godly man. And he was a godly man because there was a mother while she was alive who taught him what God wanted of him and told him that when she's no longer here, he's to carry that on, not for her sake, but for his sake. Moms make a difference. They're the energy, they're the enlightenment, they're the empowerment behind their children's direction and success. But I also want you to see something else if we can. Mothers have a great influence on their children's walk with God. Notice in verse 5, Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand that because this isn't Paul's opinion. He isn't theorizing here. This is gospel truth. And God is saying amen, amen, amen every time Paul puts something in writing. Paul says, when I call to remembrance, verse 5, the genuine faith that is in you, Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois. That's where it began. She had a faith. And she passed that faith on to her daughter Eunice, who is your mother. And I'm persuaded that what Lois had, a genuine faith, your mother Eunice had a genuine faith, I'm persuaded that you have it too. In other words, grandma's influence is seen in you, Timothy. Your mother's influence is seen in you. It's interesting in chapter 4, verse 11, the apostle Paul is preparing to die. The great Christian man, the great theologian, the great preacher, the great pastor trainer, a man who has walked with God, shook the world upside down for Jesus, is ready to leave this world. The Spirit of God has spoke to him. He's going to die. He's not going to come out of prison this time alive. He's going to have his head taken off his shoulders. You know what's interesting though why I'm telling you this? If you were going to die in 24 hours, who would you ask to come? You'd probably ask people to come that you very much loved, very much cared for, very much wanted to pass on a message of encouragement and comfort to them because you're not going to be here no more. I mean, what, am I correct? I don't think you'd call your banker or your lawyer, would you? No, you'd, you'd call people that have a special affection or attachment to you. You know who Paul called for? I don't know how many visitors he was allowed to have before they executed him. Dr. Luke was there. The family doctor, Dr. Luke, was there with the Apostle Paul. You know who else was there? John Mark. Remember John Mark? He's the writer of the Gospel of Mark. But before he was that, he was a mama's boy who bailed out on the ministry, went back home. It created a contention between Paul and Barnabas about ministry because Paul didn't want John Mark anymore. He said, listen, we took him on a mission trip. He was a mama's boy. He's soft. He's not committed. He's not passionate. He was more of a burden than he is a blessing. He ain't coming no more. And Barnabas said, no, I believe he's worth a second chance. Two great men had differences of opinion. They resolved it by Barnabas forming a mission team and Paul forming another. That's how Silas became Paul's partner, not Barnabas. But what I'm trying to get you to see is the great apostle Paul said, I want my medical doctor with me. I want this young man who failed me, but I now believe in him. I want him to be with me. I love that young man. And guess who else he wanted? 
Timothy. He said, Timothy, you come. And Timothy, come quickly. Come before winter. Don't fool around. I don't have much longer. You see, that mom and grandmother's influence transformed Timothy's life and took him from just an ordinary young man to an extraordinary young man. A man who would not only do great things in this life, but would be recognized for great things in the life to come. Moms and grandmas who are here tonight, it's your love for the Lord Jesus that is taught and caught by your children that makes the difference. Taught means you teach them with your words. Caught means you teach them with your works. Taught means you speak with your lips the truths of God's Word. Caught means you live out those truths with your life. So moms, it isn't just words, it's works. It's not just lipping it, it's living it. But a mom who's able to, to have a genuine faith, who can show that her faith is real, that Jesus is relevant, that Jesus is, is special to her. In fact, he's all that she has. Makes a difference on a child because children do not learn with their ears. Are you listening? <laughs> they don't learn with their ears. You know what they learn with? Their eyes. And children can spot pretty quick who's genuine and who's not genuine. Who's just talking the talk but not walking the walk. What matters to you, mom and grandmama, if it's communicated in word and work, lip and life, I'm telling you, it will stick on that child all their days. They'll never be able to shake it off. Never. I heard the story about a mother who talked to her pastor about her son, her highly successful son. She said, Pastor, I gave him a good education. I gave him the best education money could buy. I paid for his four-year degree. I paid for his master's degree. I prayed for his doctorate degree. I gave him a good education. I helped him become an outstanding athlete. If you go to his home, you're going to see certificates. You're going to see trophies. You're going to see acclamations of all the exploits he did on the football field, in high school and in college. I made him the athlete he was. I gave him the education he had. He married a good wife, and I was part of that. I was part of, of making sure he married a charming, talented, pretty wife. Somebody that would enhance his life, be faithful to him. And he did. I can't be more happy with my daughter-in-law. I helped him get a good career. Do you know, Pastor, he owns his own business. He's not even 30 years old and he owns his own company. He's a good citizen. He's involved in education. He's involved in civic community works. Pastor, I did all of that for my son. I gave him the best this world could offer. But I didn't give him the best God could offer. My son now has a home full of stuff, a life full of stuff, but his heart is empty of God. You see, mothers, grandmothers, if you have a genuine faith and you put God first in your life and in your home and in your family, it will have an impression on a child that will lead them toward the heavenly things. If you give them everything else but that, you've done well, I suppose. But I ask you a question. 
What would it profit if you gave your children everything this world has to offer? But they lose their own soul. I can be honest with you. My staff and I sometimes almost weep when we look back and look at parents and grandparents who could have had a, a direct influence and impact on their children and grandchildren and yet they squandered it for impact in other areas. Pastor, we can't come to church on Sunday because it's the only day off we have during the week and we've got a boat and we've got a vacation home or a getaway place and that's what we're going to do. We, we'll, watch t we'll watch the TV preacher and we'll come back to church when we can but right now that's really what we're doing on the weekend. Pastor, I believe our, our son has potential and therefore we're going to invest all of our time and money and labor into travel ball. It's not enough that he plays baseball during the season. We want him to play it 12 months a year because we believe he's going to the major leagues. But we can't come to church because we don't know where we're going to be every weekend. But I assure you when we get through, we'll be back. Pastor, we've got tickets to the Panther games. Wish we could be in church, but you know, those tickets are expensive and you go to a football game, you got to get up early, you got to tailgate. Pastor, we got to visit relatives. Our relatives are come to visit us. Can't come to church when that happens, whether we're going or coming. We've seen parents say just about that. They don't say it in quite that many ways, but that's what the impression is. And you know something? Probably four out of five, Keith, we've seen that happen to. You know where the children are at now? Far, far, far away from God. Mom and dad are trying to come back maybe. But they're not bringing their children with them because the children said you didn't care about it then. Why you care about it now? What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world yet lost his own children or lost his own soul? One more thing. We're through. Moms promote they protect their children, that the driving force behind whether a child will be ordinary, extraordinary, average, or great, will go somewhere, will go nowhere. That's what moms do. They want the best for their sons and daughters. And then moms have great influence, as we've seen. Moms and grandmas have a tremendous amount of influence over their children because they spend more time with them than anyone else. And it can be a positive influence that takes them that way, or it can be a negative influence that takes them that way, but you are influencing them. And then lastly, moms have two weapons that are powerful in their arsenal that if they will use them, they're going to see great victories in the spiritual realm. Moms, grandmas, you got two weapons. And those weapons will make a profound difference in the spiritual realm. What your child will be for the Lord Jesus and where your child will go one day in eternity. You know what those two weapons are? I had to go and get my help of some of my friends. I first went to a friend who's in heaven, but I loved him. We were very close when he was alive. He came here probably more than any man I've ever brought to this church. His name was Aaron Wilburn.
prolific songwriter. You know him for his jokes and his comedy. But he wrote a lot of serious stuff. And he gave that away, kept the funny stuff. But one of the songs that he gave to Ivan Parker, I think says a lot about one of the weapons that you moms and grandmas have in shaping and directing your child's spiritual life. I'd like to read to you the lyrics. I'm not going to sing them to you, but you listen. Mama's rocking chair. Moms, what you teach your children, they will never forget. I had a front row seat when David fought Goliath. I was looking in the den when Daniel walked with lions, saying, wake up, Samson, wake up, when Delilah cut his hair. I saw it all from Mama's rocking chair. I was sitting in the boat when Jesus walked on water. You should have, should have been there when he raised the rich man's daughter, when he opened blinded eyes and everybody stopped and stared. I saw it all from Mama's rocking chair. When she read God's holy word to me, it was so much more than history. It came alive as we were sitting there. And I saw it all from Mama's rocking chair. I learned some lessons from the finest teachers. I've listened to sermons of the greatest preachers. But everything I've heard from them, oh, it never could compare to what I saw from Mama's rocking chair. When she read God's holy word to me, it was so much more than history. It came alive as we were sitting there. And I saw it all from Mama's rocking chair. And as she painted scenes from Calvary, I could see that Jesus died for me. And I met him there in Mama's rocking chair. When your children come over, Mom, Grandma, and they pull those books up and want you to read to them, why don't you tell them some Bible stories? Bring those pictures of the Bible alive in their little eyes and mind and heart. They'll never forget them. They'll learn about him in the Bible as you spend time with them. In the Bible, in the storybooks. So Bible stories, Bible teaching, teaching them truth. You will do it better than anybody else or you'll do it worse than anybody else. But you will do it. And then the second weapon you have, moms and grandmas, is called prayer. I've once again went to the songbook. A quartet, a long time ago, in their day they were one of the finest quartets that has ever been and ever perhaps will be. They rivaled Gold City for the number one spot in the cathedrals. They all three went back and forth. The group was the Kingsman Quartet. And they had a song called, When Mama Prayed, Heaven Paid Attention. I'd like to read to you some of the lyrics of that song. By the way, Mama's Rockin' Chairs on YouTube, if you want to go there and Listen to it sung. The Kingsman song, When Mama Prayed, Heaven Paid Attention, is also there. But let me read just some portions of this. Because it's about a mother praying. And how God's ear is especially inclined to a mother who's praying for her kids. When Mama prayed, Heaven Paid Attention, the angels spread their wings and stood prepared once again, old Satan knew he had been defeated because God had heard my dear old mama's prayers. In this modern age of missiles, tanks and ships and guns, when men believe there's just one way a war is ever won, I've had that secret weapon 
that all bombs cannot compare. I've won a thousand battles with dear old mama's prayers. And mama prayed. The angels up in heaven would bow their heads and listen to her prayers. They knew that God heard and he would answer because her faith in God was real and she believed. When mama prayed, heaven paid attention. The angels spread their wings and stood prepared. Once again, old Satan knew he had been defeated. Listening, moms and grandmas, because God heard dear old mama's prayers. So moms, you are important. Probably the greatest importance in the home. And how you do in this awesome responsibility God has entrusted to you will have a large degree in determining where your children are going to go and any more where the grandchildren are going to go. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.